episode 30. Greetings and welcome into the Patuxent General. This week's adventure changes like the weather in Rhode Island in September. We will talk about rose hips, not to mention a very scary story about Lad's school in our House on the Corner series. And take a lovely walk to the Rhode Island Yacht Club. Plus, a few extra surprises. But first, I need to thank our Patreon subscribers. These sweet and tart folk are the blueberries, lemon curd, and puff pastry in the fresh Danish that is the Patuxent General, without whom we would merely be icing. So thank you! If you would like to become one of these fine pastry people, look for us on Patreon.com or follow the link in the show notes. A small donation gets you extra content, first crack at new episodes and documentation from past episodes, photos of drinks, and original recipe cards. But first... Let's talk about rose hips. Around most of the beaches in Rhode Island, Rosa Ragosa is used to control sand erosion, especially on Block Island. You can check out what they think about the flower on the blockislandferry.com. Their blog talks about many names and purposes for this Asian origin plant. It is evasive and durable, with a brightly colored flower throughout most of the summer. But in the early fall, it's time for rose hips. These small crabapple-looking fruits are bright red and round when ripe, both sweet and sour at this point. They can be eaten right off the plant, collected and made into jam, and rose hips have a good deal of natural pectin in them, so this works well. As a child, my dad was a lifeguard during the summers, so I spent most of my time at the beach. So often late in the season, when I was hungry, he would say to me, Go munch a few rose hips, then we'll have clam cakes and chowder in a bit. This is late summer in Rhode Island. This week, at the beach with our dad, my sister and I collected rose hips to make drinks just for you. First, a rose hip tea. For this recipe, you will need rose hips, about six good size ones, a teapot and strainer, two tablespoons of honey, and 20 ounces of hot water, just below boiling. Wash your rose hips to remove sand, Remove dry leaves on the bottom, then crush them and put them into the teapot. Add enough hot water and honey. Stir gently for a minute or two, and then let sit for another two minutes. Then strain into two cups. The color will stun you, and the vitamin C boost will lift you up. Relax and enjoy. How about a rosehip cocktail? For this recipe, you will need, for the syrup, one half a cup of water, one half cup sugar, and one half cup rose hips, fresh, washed, and crushed. You will also need a bar spoon, some Prosecco, one ounce rum of your choice, two ounces rose hip syrup, and a champagne flute. Let's start with the syrup. Simmer the water, sugar, and rose hips until it thickens a little, then strain. After it is chilled, add two ounces of the syrup to the glass and stir the chilled rum in with a bar spoon. Then top with chilled Prosecco and on top of that, a Rosa Ragosa Rose. Enjoy! This week's local meandering is to the Rhode Island Yacht Club, just down the street and two turns from the Patuxent General store and studio itself. Since 1887, the Yacht Club has stood in Stillhouse Cove. More information on their history is available at rhodeislandyachtclub.org slash history. But I'm here to talk about the view and the walk. There are amazing pictures of the Yacht Club itself on this site, but the view along the way is, well, what makes this so intriguing? On the Warwick side of the bridge, the lanterns are on your left and the triangle tops of houses dot the eastern horizon. When you cross the bridge, it becomes Broad Street and thins dramatically as cars, people, vendors, folks eating at outdoor tables all crowd around for a bit. But if you travel just a little further, your water view returns. This walk takes us the rest of the way through Patuxent Village proper. If you remove the future from your vision, perhaps squint a little, you can see the bones of the old Patuxent Village, see past gas stations and restaurant traffic, and there it is in the architecture and horticulture. A gently slanted walk north leads you to Ocean Avenue. If you turn right onto Ocean Avenue, the breeze brings the promise of the sea. And as you turn east, the shade from giant trees cool your path. And it doesn't take far for the water in front of you to peek through. In the mornings, day's first light speckles across the water as ducks drift past. But the drama really hits you as you get to the cove. 
This is the picture on the front page of the Rhode Island Yacht Club website. Boats, surf, wildlife, and our gorgeous coast. What more could you ask for? Enjoy. I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his electromagnetic pinball museum and restoration arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball, EM pinball, and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. And now for a special The House in the Corner series, The Lad School Horror. In 2015, I was assigned to a project that would require me to work for a month upon the grounds of the former Rhode Island School for the Feeble-Minded, later known as the Exeter School, even later known as the Dr. Joseph H. Ladd School, or Center, before it was closed down for its decades of abuse of human rights to its inmates in 1994. The Exeter School was opened in 1908 with the hopes of curing and improving the people of our state who were troubled with behavioral, emotional, and mental divergences. It became a place where people with disabilities were neglected and abused even until death. Diseases spread rampantly from the unsanitary conditions and in 1918 alone, 350 inmates died of the flu. Hepatitis and tuberculosis would soon come and join them in wiping out the inmates in a short dance from a bricked-in prison to a pauper's cemetery where people were buried under their serial number instead of their names if they were fortunate enough to receive any grave marking at all. The patterns of pestilence, abuse, and neglect would continue throughout the existence of the school. In a 1956 expose, the Providence Sunday Journal reported abuses and crimes and shortfallings to an outraged public. The brick buildings were kept by the staff in an overcrowded condition. There was one doctor for hundreds of patients. People suffered and died in this place for a hundred years. And while the exposure brought about very few gradual reforms, In the end, the Mandela of evil would continue to cost countless lives, cast into unmarked graves on the farm at the Ladd School in Exeter. Stories emerged of violent offenders all being housed together on the third floor unobserved to do as they wished to each other, as well as any who the sadistic guards would send upstairs as punishment. A man was left in a cold shower to die wrapped in his bedsheets. Doctors operated without anesthesia. These dark rumors, while unsubstantiated, were certainly believable, and they continue to be told by scattered survivors. So, now that I have told you more about the location and the background of the asylum that I called the office for 30 days that I wish I could forget, let me tell you about the terrifying experiences that I observed while I worked. I will give my co-witnesses pseudonyms to protect their identity and privacy. When I drove onto the grounds of this place, there was a gate with a no trespassing sign. But beyond the visceral warning, there was a chill that went up and down my spine every time I crossed the threshold, coming or going. I knew that I was going to a place where people were no longer welcomed. Every time I reported or left the place, I felt unseen eyes on me while I was on the grounds, that uncanny and unmistakable feeling of being observed. Physically, the place was disgusting, contaminated, neglected, and falling apart around us. And when I say it was filthy, I mean it was a place that could never be cleared of the energy that lingered in its halls. Broken glass covered every inch of the grounds and ironically, nature had mostly retaken the buildings. We were in building one for the entire project. Building one was where the survivors documented a handsome amount of their torture and violence over the sinister hospital's long tenure had occurred. Cell phones did not work reliably on the grounds and would have a tendency of cutting off calls at key moments of the conversation. On the first day of work at the site, I was doing work on the second floor stairwell. Things had gotten quiet when I heard a noise coming from the third floor upstairs. I did not know the history of that floor at that time. The noise sounded like it was coming from a human or an animal. It was a kind of grunting and gnashing of teeth, like a human trying to sound like a sick animal. 
I ran upstairs to investigate, only to find the room barren with a thick layer of undisturbed dust on the floor. No person could have escaped view so quickly without leaving a footprint in the decades-old dust that covered everything. As the day went on, I would continue to hear this grunting noise, along with periodic footfalls on the steps above me throughout the day during broad daylight. Eventually, a team started to work up there, and that stopped the phenomenon. On another day, I was with a large group of co-workers on the second floor of the building in a playroom. We had a bunch of people seated in a circle, and there was a rubber child's ball in the room. We started to talk about the history of Lad's school, and people were asking me if I had seen any evidence of haunting. And that was when the ball started to roll around the room, all by itself. There were about a dozen of us who witnessed this large rubber ball start rolling on a flat surface and picking up speed as it did so. It rolled around the circle of people and then into the center of the group, where it stopped rolling. Wait, what? The group flustered. Did you set that up? One of the group members asked me. I was speechless and aghast. We all saw that. It happened. Is this place haunted? Yes, it is. There was our answer. As an ongoing haunt, there were three instances that occurred as follows. One night, Julian, our location contact, was the last person to be locking up the building. They reported to me that on their way out as the last person, something in the back corner had called their name. I relayed my story of the gnashing on the third floor. We kept working. Another night, just before the location contact was about to lock the door, our company medic realized that he had forgotten his clipboard in the building where we had been working. He ran inside to retrieve it. When he emerged, he looked terrified. His face was pale, his eyes were sullen and sunken, he was hyperventilating and shaking like a leaf. Patrick exited, terrified by whatever had happened to him in the moments before his egress from the brick prison. What's up? I asked him, concerned. His story was similar to Julian's. It said my name, he said. It knew my name. Something in there said my name on my way out of that building. On the last night of the project, it was me. Somebody I liked had forgotten their table on the second floor staircase. I did not want to send that person into the building alone. It was pitch dark as we had cleared all the work lights, so only my flashlight lit the way. It was a fresh take on an already terrifying scene. In a heightened state of anxiety, I retrieved the folding table and made my way down the pitch black staircase to the first floor, where the large open exit was in sight. I rushed toward that light without running in the dark. Falling or dropping my light was not something I planned to allow. Then, as I passed the large dormitory room on my left, I heard a voice calling out my name. I had a nickname that everybody called me on that job, and nobody used my actual name ever, except whatever was calling to me from the far corner of that dorm room. John. And when I emerged, I was as pale as I had seen the other two co-workers when they exited that place. Now the place is all but razed to the ground. Only the stories and history remain with a few of its former denizens who are treated in more humane facilities now and are given autonomy and care on a case-by-case -case basis rather than an abusive and unfair one. And when I drove out of that place on my last day, I was relieved that we were the last living groups of people that would trespass on that cursed place. Let it be dust and memories. Let it become an old ghost story. Let us hope that they never build such a place again. But never let us forget the lives lost and destroyed by the failed and abusive systems that inevitably cursed these people and this land for all time. These specters were made by humankind by way of budget cuts and lost empathy. Those ghosts are still there so that we never forget. The road to hell was truly paved with good intentions. Thank you once again for joining us here at the PG. If you have a ghost story, question on a recipe, or comment about any story, or would like to reach out about our pop-up general store, our email is jess at patuxetgeneral.com. We would love to hear from you. We may even use your story on the podcast. I can't wait for that. But until then, I'll meet you right back here next time at the Patuxet General. 
a something for posterity production. Pre-recorded in Patuxent.